Hello, everyone. I'm Kat Timpf, along with Eric Bowling and Ebony K. Williams. We are the Fox News Specialists. Monday's horrific suicide bombing by Salman Abidi in Manchester looking like a much bigger conspiracy. I think it's very clear that this is a network that we are investigating. And as I've said, it continues at a pace. Uh, there's extensive investigations going on uh, and activity taking place across Greater Manchester as we speak. With fresh raids underway, UK law enforcement has now arrested at least six people in connection with the bombing, including Abidi's older brother. Officials say the British-born Abidi was already known to UK authorities. And Fox News is now reporting that Abidi spent three weeks in Libya prior to the bombing. He returned to England just days before the Ariana Grande concert. Meanwhile, in Libya, officials have arrested Abidi's father and younger brother on suspicion of links to ISIS. Yeah, so that's obviously not good. And in Europe, they seem to have problems with communication when it comes to their different agencies communicating with each other. When it comes to spotting terrorism, I'm actually blown away what's going on today and yesterday and today. Yesterday we ran a soundbite of Caddy Kay on on my friend's Morning Joe Morning Joe Scarborough show, and she said this: Europe is getting used to attacks like this, Mika, and she's talking to Mika Brzezinski. We have to because we are never going to be able to totally wipe this out. Now, Caddy Kay is a reporter for the BBC in in London, in Europe. That's disturbing enough, but today. Um, maybe yesterday afternoon or this morning, Andy Burnham, the mayor of Manchester, came out and said this. We're grieving today, but we're strong. Today will be business as usual as far as possible in our great city. No, 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 no. No, it's not business as usual. You don't get used to it. It's terror. It's killing children. You get outraged and you go after it and you have to do it in a way that you don't worry about offending certain groups. And you say, we're going to wipe this out. We're going to take care of it. But to say it's business as usual, boy, I have a real problem with the way the, the, the Europeans, especially the Brits, are framing this. Oh, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe they were just trying to say that they weren't going to let the terrorists impact their way of life, was the way I interpreted it. Yeah, and I think that's the issue. You two are representing the dual ways it can be interpreted. Right. Is it a put your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist when obviously children are dying, communities are dying, uh, everyone is, is certainly in danger? Or is it, to your point, Kat, is it a, a, a spirit of resiliency and, and saying, you know what, they're not going to win. We're going to continue to live our best life, so to speak, uh, in spite of their efforts to destroy us. I think that both have to be uh, considered here. Absolutely. Well, uh, consider them, but folks, let's not become Europe and let's push away from that sort of PC no, mentality. I obviously, that, that's, that's obviously that's agree with that. All right. Let's meet today's specialists. He is a former White House press secretary for President George W. Bush and a best-selling author for his book, Taking Heat. He's also the founder of Fleischer Communications, and he specializes in being a huge New York Yankees and Miami Dolphins fan. Ari Fleischer is here. And he was a senior spokesman and traveling press secretary for Hillary Clinton. He's a Fox News contributor, and he's the founding executive director of Georgetown University's Institute of Politics and Public Service. But he specializes in campaign trail karaoke bars. Mo Elathi is here. All right, so Mo, I'm going to start with you. How, how did you. how did you see this? People there's, are trying to draw comparisons between the UK and could this happen here. The way I see it, there's a lot of things we do better when it comes to fighting terrorism, communication, Muslim immigrants assimilating better that they don't do over there. How, how fair do you think that those comparisons are? Look, I mean, just listening to the conversation that you and Eric just had, I mean, I, I don't think these are mutually exclusive arguments. I, I, I don't either. think they should be mutually exclusive arguments. We should be outraged. I'm outraged. Right. We all are outraged by what happened. And we should go after the bad guys. But that doesn't mean we should slow down our way of life. That's what they want to do. They want to disrupt us. Ari will remember this. I remember President Bush in the days following 9-11 taking a very strong uh, tack in talking about uh, going after the terrorists, but also saying they are not going to slow us down as Americans. We are yeah, going but, but, to continue but Mo, to live our lives. But Mo, he stood on that pile of rubble, and I was there. I was there for that. Yeah. He stood with the megaphone, and Ari, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and he said, we're coming after you. We're going to get you. Yeah, I, didn't, I, I understand that you're not going to take us down, but that's a far cry from the mayor the very next day of Manchester saying, oh, you know what, business as usual, or Caddy K, a prominent uh, BBC reporter saying, we need to get used to this in Europe. Uh-uh, no way, not here, not New York, 
not the United States. Yeah, the other part of the narrative I think is missing. There is a crucial bifurcation you have to make here. It is fully appropriate for the public to say we want to get on with our lives. We want to have business as usual. But the job of government is to destroy these people. And that is what elected officials have to say, convey, and that has to be the emotions that they pass on. You want the public to feel that they can delegate this to the, to the government, and it can be destroyed. It can be stopped. It was when we said we're going to do it to communism, and we did. It was when you remember the Red Brigade and the Irish Republican Army. Those were stopped. People thought, we can't stop it. There are going to be bombs in the street. You can stop it. You have to stop it by playing permanent offense. So to stopping it, let's talk about the fact that this uh, suicide bomber here was in Libya just three weeks prior to and then returned to England after that. That strikes me because it's my understanding, Eric, I want to go to you on this, uh, that President Trump is doing a new strategy to annihilate uh, this type of terrorism. Uh, specifically, Defense Secretary Mattis is saying that he's doing a different tactical approach. Instead of waiting for them to come out, he's going in, going directly in, being more aggressive, giving them more leeway to be more aggressive in their ability to go in, just so that this type of thing doesn't happen, so that people are not returning home, either sharing intelligence or becoming more radicalized, and then going back. Do you think that's a very important? So, yeah, so Trump right? outlines Excuse in that big that big terror speech that, that he gave a couple of days ago. He said, "This is it, it, the war on terror is a fight of good versus evil." That's a far cry from what we're hearing from the European officials. I'd also like to point out, you very accurately point out, that this guy, uh, Salman Abidi, went to Libya. He came back. He's been in uh, Syria, allegedly in Syria as well. The whole family is a network of, of ISIS-trained fighters. Hang on. But this is very important. Trump, one of Trump's uh, travel moratorium countries is Libya. So when he says, let's hold off before we just indiscriminately let people come in from Libya, let's make sure, let's extreme vet them so we don't have Abidis coming right. to New York instead of Manchester. I, I uh, certainly anyway. have no problem with extreme vetting, but it's important to give ourselves credit, our leaders credit for the fact that this hasn't happened here, that since 9-11, every single deadly Islamic terrorist attack has been by someone who was here legally or was a citizen. We do seem to be doing a good job of communicating our state, our federal, our local governments communicate with each other about these sorts of things the way that they just simply aren't in Europe. Mm -hmm. So that does have a lot to do with it, too, as well as assimilation. And another part of preserving our way of life, to me, is to make sure that we don't do things that could destroy our own civil liberties in trying to destroy ISIS. We don't want to, they want to take away our way of life. I want to be very careful that we don't let emotions run high and just do it for them. Well, no, we don't need to be reactive. I agree with you, Kat. This is where we need to be smart. We need to have uh, emotional and pragmatic intelligence here, to your point, using the, the strengths we have. Look, this was a place I was continuously cr cr criticizing uh, President Obama around. I didn't think there was enough aggression on this issue of terror, mm -hmm. for sure. So uh, uh, for all of the criticisms I have for President Trump, this is a place where I commend him. I commend him for saying, you know what? Uh, they're not can, a JV team. Can, We're can going we, to can annihilate. Can point something out, though? Mm -hmm. and, and, and Ari, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. President Obama was looking to in substantially increase our ref the, the, the acceptance of refugees, the, the program. He went from... I think it was 116,000 in his last year. Hillary Clinton was looking for four or 500,000 refugees to take on. Do we not see the dangers of doing things like this? This family, this family was a refugee family from Libya. I'm not with you on this one. No, he was born in the, in the United Kingdom. The Manchester yes. terrorist was born his, in the United his Kingdom. His parents were parents refugees. Weren't. Well, my mother was born abroad. I was born here. So I'm not sure the solution is to say because people's parents were born somewhere else, you can't be here. I am not with President Trump on the Muslim ban. I never have been the so-called Muslim it's ban. Not a Muslim I ban. don't. Come on, think... let's call it what it is. Well, the, it's not a Muslim the... ban. It's a ban. Uh, it's a moratorium. But not he had an issue that he wanted from the to seven, start. Of origin, the seven uh, religion from the seven countries. The issue here is if you have people coming in from a place that's lawless, that, like Syria. Well, you cannot verify anybody's identity because there's no town hall to check with. It's a bunch of rubble. You don't, people can assume an alternative, alternative uh, identification and no one can catch them. That's legitimate. Stop people coming from lawless places. But places where there is a rule of law, even if it's a Muslim country, if it's a Muslim country, uh, that uh, in uh, itself uh, is not a the, basis the vast, to ban the, the majority of the refugees that, that we took in in 2016, 116,000, I think the, the biggest feeder was Syria. Well, Syria, I've made the distinction on yeah, Syria. And none of lawless, them have killed anyone in a, a terrorist country. attack. My but dad. the point my here, dad, right. that, Libya, All the refugees we took in, none of them have killed anyone in a terrorist attack. Yeah, but, but again, again, we are five times the size of Germany as a country, and we took in 
one-tenth of the number of refugees that Germany wants to take in. This is what I'm talking about. If so you, we don't become Germany. Right? But we don't become Germany. But that's what he, Trump is trying I wanna to get, I want to get no, I want to get No, I mean, look, I think part of the problem is what we're not talking about is what happens in these refugee camps when, when we're not pulling people out. Now, I'm not saying open the doors wide open, come one, come all, right? We have a very strong vetting system for the refugees that the United States brings in, and we got to give our law enforcement, our immigration folks, and, and Homeland Security all the credit that they deserve for that. But these refugee camps are prime recruiting territory for ISIS, for terrorists. If we can, through vetting, help people get out of that and get back on their feet, and what we have seen is that they have become productive members of our society. The ones who, They're not out there causing trouble. They're not out there uh, creating terror attacks. There's got to be a middle ground here rather than all or nothing. Or, Mo, there's a stronger defense, and that is intelligence. The issue is not going to be solved through refugee vetting or through not allowing some countries in or not to come in. The issue is how aggressive are we with our intelligence gathering and operations. And this is where Edward Snowden has done irreparable damage to the United States and the critics of the NSA have. These are the programs that you have to have in an open, tolerant, welcoming, inclusive country, which is what the United States is. And that has to be married to a tough intelligence operation to gather information on the people who take advantage of our generosity and would do us harm. And, and, and I think what you just said is tough. important. They have to be married to one another, right? Too much of the conversation right now is either or. It's this or it's this. The reality is if we're going to take on terrorism, we have to have it all. We have to be able to use intelligence. We have to be open and compassionate where it makes sense. We have to have the vetting. We have to have strong military, strong but, diplomatic. But okay. Okay. But, 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 not here's the problem with what you here's the problem with what you're saying. Europe has uh, historically opened borders within the countries. We've, we've talked about that ad nauseum. We, there are also countries within Europe who are willing to be more aggressive taking on refugees. And as Ari astutely points out, you don't know where a vast majority of these people come from. They don't have educational records. They don't have work records. They don't have prison records. They just the show up and they're able to come in. Our, some of our leaders, Hillary Clinton, was looking to quadruple or, or multiply by five the number of refugees we were willing to take. That becomes very dangerous because there is no way to vet who these But we don't are. want to equate all refugees, though, Eric, with uh, that type of risk because we know that's not true. Not all refugees represent the type of risk. This is where we have to be smart and target those that we do. Again, going back to accurate criminal profiling, not religious or racial Absolutely. profiling. Absolutely. All right. President Trump arriving in Belgium, preparing to rally NATO members to up the ante against ISIS. We're coming right back. Tell me why he President Trump hitting the fourth leg of his inaugural foreign trip in Belgium today, arriving in advance of a high-stakes NATO summit. The president will reportedly endorse NATO's mutual aid pledge for the first time and rally efforts to combat radical Islamic terror after the Manchester attack. We will work together on various problems. Number one right now is terrorism, and uh, we are fighting very hard, doing very well under our generals, and. Uh, making tremendous progress, but when you see something like happened two days ago, you realize how important it is to win this fight, and we will win this fight. All right, how comforting do you think that type of uh, language coming out of the president is for those who were nervous and skeptical when early on we saw then-candidate Trump talking about uh, his skepticism around how beneficial NATO was to America at this point and how some people weren't carrying their weight. Well, I'm not really interested in being comforting to our West European allies. I'm interested in getting things done. Okay. And Donald Trump in the campaign was on to a very important issue, and that is 23 of the 28 nations in NATO don't pay their fair share. Yes. And they never have. They take advantage of us. There are only five nations in NATO that pay, and it's the United States, United Kingdom, as always. We're in excess of 2%. UK is. Estonia, Poland, and Greece. The rest, not a single other Western European nation you know. It's not France, not Germany. None of those economic behemoths. Nobody is doing what they're supposed to do, so we have the burden on us. So I actually think Donald Trump 
threw the towel in a little too early by accommodating NATO and saying, I'm with you now. I'd like to keep the pressure on NATO to get them to do more. Mo, how about that? I mean, I do think a lot of people felt that we do pay too much and maybe don't get uh, some of what the people that aren't paying, that already points out in, in. Is, is that a fair thing? And should Trump have been harder on it? Uh, at demanding yes. that our native, uh, NATO allies pay, pay more, their pay share. their fair share, absolutely appropriate. However, and this is where I get a little concerned, I think why we're hearing so much concern out of Europe right now, and that is we are in tenuous times, right? We are in a period where Europe is under assault, where borders are mushy when it comes to you know, the, the traditional nation state you know, model isn't exactly what we're in right now. To have the United States raising questions about whether or not it will be there for our allies when you've got terrorism coming up from one direction and Russia coming in from the other direction is something that is going to raise a lot of concerns. Now, if you're saying this is just a negotiating tactic, I think it's a dangerous negotiating ta negotiation tactic. But Eric, what if it's more uh, than that? When's uh, the right time? There, there's an important <laughs> distinction that we're not making right here. President Trump is on to something, and he's not demanding that the other 23, actually 24 now, because we just somehow decided to put Montenegro in, in NATO for some wild, crazy reason, because that's just another country we're going to have to defend crazy. if they pick a fight. That's crazy. But he demanded that they pay their fair share, not to NATO, to themselves. To That's spend right. your own That's money correct. on your own defense, defense, and 23 or now 24 of the 29 aren't doing, which is even crazier. We're not demanding them to pay cut. Well, look, we're already uh, putting in $685 million a year. And the Montenegro to NATO. decision 20, was crazy. 22% right. of the NATO to be a budget. Criteria. We're, not, we're not demanding all these other countries put money into NATO. Just spend your money on your own defense. Yeah. Well, the, the, the initial criteria was supposed to be that you're supposed to be established a little more stable in order to be a part of NATO. And apparently, we just kind of threw that out the window. So even though I totally understand your point for sure that you don't want to abandon them when you see what's going on there and act like you won't be there for them, but definitely throwing too much of our resources in without getting enough back. But here's the side of me that always has welcomed Donald Trump and his ability to shake things up. Previous administrations, including the George W. Bush administration, Obama, Clinton, you can go back time and memorial, has said the same thing, that NATO needs to pay more, they need to pay their fair share. They say it, and they don't do anything about it. Along came Donald Trump sounding different, acting different, and talking tough. And this is what has gotten Europe scared, because they think he is different. They know how to ignore American presidents. They know how to play the game, saying, very good point, Mr. President. We're going to take a good look at that. We'll see you in Brussels, and nothing happens. But to your point, Ari, right, you just criticized him for throwing in the towel a little too early, right? Whether or not he's actually able to exact the result any differently is an open question. In the meantime, he kept his our on the gas. adversaries are hearing the, the president of the United States, or the candidate at the time for president of the United States, saying, I don't know if we're going to be there for NATO. You've got Russia, which is being fairly aggressive these days in, in how it's treating the rest of the world, right? You're going to see, you've got North Korea being more aggressive. You're seeing all these countries being more aggressive, our adversaries starting to push the Mo, buttons. that's a great point, and that's why those nations need to increase their defense spending. Yes, well, Bingo. it's going to be the right time, I agree. Yep. Coming up, celebrities like Katy Perry sounding off in the wake of the Manchester attack and possibly proving just how out of touch they are over the terror threat. Stay with us. Can I kick it? Can I kick it? Can I kick it? After the deadly Manchester terror attack by those evil losers, we want to show you some footage from a short time ago of soccer fans in Manchester watching a Manchester United soccer game just days after the deadly attack. And that happened just a little while ago. And Ebony, we want to be proud to report that Man U, Manchester beat Ajax 2-0 to win a Europa Cup. How about that? And they should be applauded and celebrated. That's awesome. And, and Kat, life goes on. Well, it's good to see them having a good time. They should be. The terrorists would hate it. All right, let's move on to this. Some celebrities have come forth with their own opinions on fighting terror. Pop superstar Katy Perry saying this on the Manchester bombing. I just feel devastated. I think that the greatest thing we can do is just unite and love on each other and like no barriers, no borders. Like it, it, we're, we all need to just coexist. Like no borders. What, fighting terror with love? 
That's pretty rich considering Katy Perry travels with a well-armed team of killer security guards. Meanwhile, UK rocker Morrissey is livid at British politicians for their PC treatment of Islamic extremists. He posted this, this on his Facebook page. He said, quote, Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham says the attack is the work of an extremist. What extremist? An extreme rabbit? In modern Britain, everyone seems petrified to officially say what we all say in private. Politicians tell us they're unafraid, but they're never the victims. How easy to be unafraid when one is protected from the line of fire. The people have no such protections. I'll start out in this end. We'll work our way around. Um, two different views, two different celebrities. What are yeah, your thoughts? You, you know, I try to stay clear of what celebrities think. Um, they often don't think <laughs> too <idea>. much. Um, <laughs> But, you know, Hollywood, I'm glad in some ways they're in charge of our dreams and our hopes. I'm glad they have nothing to do with our reality. Um, let them be aspirational. Let them dream. Let the people who have to, leave, have to protect us from terrorism be in charge. Yeah, and Ebony Morrissey says, look, you, you politicians, you can say you're unafraid, but we the people are out here without protection. We're a little afraid. Call it what it is, ex uh, Islamic extremists. And the people have to pay the ultimate consequence, Eric, and you're exactly right. And when Katy Perry, you know... On the first end of that, let's love on each other. Okay, I'm with that. But then in the next sense, you say open borders as if somehow that's a prescription to what obviously is a very big problem. And, and I don't know when sovereignty became a dirty word, Eric. I don't know when having, uh, you know, a, a clear boundary around what uh, areas belong to who became so uh, controversial and problematic. It really is beyond me because, you know, I'm very open minded. But my goodness, I believe in borders and I believe in sovereignty. Yeah, and, and as I pointed out, Kat, Katy Perry travels with armed security guards. She, right, she absolutely does. And the quote made her sound a little silly, but the full thing is she said, she said that the greatest thing we can do now is unite as people as fan bases, all of it. So the internet can be a bit ruthless as far as fan bases go. So maybe she was talking a little bit more about Beyonce and Rihanna fans getting along in times of terror. <laughs> sometimes the internet, they can get a little like, against each other. I'm team Rihanna myself. She's clearly the best one. But it, it sounds ignorant, but I'm sure she didn't mean, like, let's let terrorists into our houses. Mo, is there anything wrong with calling an Islamic extremist an Islamic extremist? Are, are you going to refer to the Muslim doctors who were there in Manchester helping the victims? No, just the extremists, Muslim, right? Just the My extremists. point is, they are just extremists, and they're co-opting the Islamic faith. To the topic, I don't give a damn what Katy Perry thinks. I don't care what Morrissey thinks. They both made a point, and I think both points were off base. At the end of the day, if we're going to tackle this, I want a political strategy. I want a what diplomatic strategy. I want an Morrissey economic strategy. I do not want a celebrity strategy. That's not but, going but to get us there. What was off base about Morrissey calling out the mayor, Burnham, uh, the mayor Burnham of Manchester saying, hey, you know, let's call it what it is. If we can't name the enemy, how are we going to fight they the enemy? They are extremists. There's no doubt. There is no question. There is no disagreement that they are extremists. Extremists what? Extremist killers. I'm an extremist, extremist runner terrorist. a couple times a week. I mean, uh, but I'm not an extremist terrorist. If you can't name the enemy, this is the problem I had with Eric, the Eric, Barack Obama. Eric, I'm Obama, sorry. That he couldn't they say Islamic They are extremists. calling it. They are calling them extremists. That's what they are. Their faith isn't what is driving them. Their extremism, it is what is driving them. That is the reality. Well, actually, Mo, I think the faith is what's driving well, them. You I, I would be wrong. I, I it's a perversion of their faith. are killing the infidel, right? And but infidel that is, is not, those are not Muslims. There were more Muslims in Manchester helping the victims. they're not killing, Mo. The ones who are, are blowing themselves up are radical, are, are religious fanatics. They're perverting. They're fanatics. Yeah, they're they're perverting. perverting the faith. They are not embracing it. They are perverting well, it. What do we have a problem calling what it is? They're radical Islamic extremists. They are what they are. They're not radical Christian extremists. But they're not radical those. pilots. We have those. But when we have them, did we right. call Dylan Roof, who walked into South Carolina, a radical Christian an extremist? extremist? We absolutely should. You would call him a Christian, so we're going to start sure. assigning their faith, every killer's faith, as a descriptor of who they are. Well, I don't think we hide from it. Uh, Ari, do we hide from, from the, have, the, the, the adjective? They are radical Islamist extremists. I have no problem saying it. That's what they are. But I think what's more important is not what we call them, but what we do to them. That's right. And that's, that's why right. I want to see the government play permanent offense. That's why I want our intelligence to be tough and invasive for the people we need to be invasive with who are not American citizens. And if it's a citizen, I want a warrant. 
But this is where we have to fight this as a military operation. We have to get our allies to pay what they need to, and we have to be far more aggressive than we've been. You can call it whatever you want. Can, but can, can I, can I well, political correctness has played, a, has played a role in making it harder, though, if you look at something like San Bernardino, where the neighbors Brilliant. saw things that they were afraid to say we because they were worried say, about being called Islamophobic. Think political correctness has in that aided sense, terrorists it in one bit in Let, one it, a, a lot of read from the USA, USA Today, which is by no means a right wing or conservative publication, US, reports that the quote U.S. led coalition has increased the number of bombs dropped on the Islamic State by 50 percent this year, saying the increase comes as President Trump has given battlefield commanders more authority to approve airstrikes and raids. Yeah. If yep, you can call what it what it is, you can attack it and you can go after it and you can kill it. And if you play PC and political, you're never going to do it. You know, the real example of this was that school child in Texas who made a class project in a science class. And, clock boy? Yeah, yes. clock boy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And somebody turned him in. Now, when that happens, if you have a question, turn him in. Let the authorities judge what happens right or wrong. But don't invite him to the White House, make a big deal of him, and sell, say to people, you are wrong to have questions and raise them. Right. I don't have a problem calling Islamic uh, extreme terrorists, Eve, but here's the thing. That doesn't get rid of it by itself. we got to okay. do more. Okay. We'll leave it right there. President Trump hiring a top private attorney for the Russian investigation. Will it help beat back the left-wing mob hell-bent <laughs> on taking him down? Ebony's docket is on the case. Next. Welcome back to the Fox News Specialist. Our specialists today are Ari Fleischer and Mo Elithi. Let's continue the conversation with the docket. <laughs> now, typically, people use the phrase lawyer up as a pejorative or negative thing. And frankly, I think that's unfortunate and silly. Retaining a skilled legal representative is always a good idea because it's better to be safe than to be sorry. I maintain that position under all circumstances, and therefore, the news that President Trump is reportedly lawyering up by hiring attorney Mark Kazowitz to advise him pending the Russia probe doesn't bother me one bit. The Sixth Amendment right to counsel is imperative, and all Americans should feel free to exercise it at any time without presumptions of guilt or wrongdoing. President Trump is being very smart to bring Kazowitz in at this point, because as the investigation continues, the White House counsel, well, they represent the office of the presidency, but not Donald J. Trump, the man. So as the investigation plays out in the campaign or Mr. Trump himself becomes a potential target, things can get complicated. What's protected? What's not? What's privileged? Whose interests are really being represented? The government has smartly brought in independent counsel, so it's only fitting and appropriate that President Trump has done the same thing. Any objections from the table? Anybody have a Overruled problem? Overruled if there are. Are you a yeah. lawyer? Right. I, uh, I thought so. A little bit. I, don't know I how wrote I... that myself. I... Yes. <laughs> yeah. no, that is perfect sense. Thank and, you. and I can only tell you, as somebody who stood at that podium in the White House, you want to have another unit inside the White House to handle this issue. Yeah. And you want it for two reasons. One is you want the briefing room where you're talking to be about substance and the president's policies, repeal and replace of Obamacare, the tax cuts, things of that nature. Yes. But you also don't want a subpoena. And this is the old Mike McCurry rule, President Clinton's press secretary. If I have to go to the president and say, Mr. President, I'm going to ask these questions about the investigation, what should I say? I then become a witness. Yep. And then the prosecution can come after me if there is one, or even as they just gather facts. And then do I have to lawyer up, separate it, separate it have a counsel's unit that handles it, and let the government be the government? Absolutely. Mo, your take on it? Oh. I, I don't disagree. I think it is smart for the president, given everything that's going on, to have his own counsel. I think, frankly, the White House counsel has become part of the story, it's right, with the, with, the, with, with the information that's come out about how Sally Yates went to him and gave him this information. And, you know, now you know, uh, he's part of the story. So having a separate unit to, to work with the president on this makes a lot of sense. Okay. And his, his choice of who he picked was very... Very Trump of him, right? He has these people that he has around him that he trusts, and that's the most important thing to him. Doesn't matter what specialty this or that. Trust this guy. This is my lawyer, and he's gonna let him handle. It. And I think that the way he's been handling this in general lately, kind of just not weighing in one way or another, is what he should have started doing a while ago. And I'm glad to see him doing it now. 
Very uh, importantly, Charlie Gasparino broke the story yesterday that it was going to be th this uh, Mark Kasowitz. Mark Kasowitz, according to Gasparino, also people close to Kasowitz have said that he believes it's complete BS, this whole charade that's going on. That's the lawyer speaking, allegedly, again, according to Gasparino. Well, what would hope the president's lawyer? Would hope he would hire someone that feels that way. Well, but, but then he goes a little bit further and says his statements to, uh, to Comey, for example, I hope he drops the charges or not direct edicts, but rather express opinion. And that's something you might weigh in on. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we I've spoke many times on this show about the specific intent requirement. That's got to be there if you're going to even move forward with an obstruction charge. It's going to be incumbent on the president's counsel to say, you know what? At best, if there was a conversation with Comey, whatever he said was suggestive. Mm -hmm. his, his intentionality was not to impede or to thwart any proceeding or investigation. That will be certainly, certainly that argument. But here's another legal story for you guys on the docket. In a memo out on Monday, AG Jeff Sessions tried to clarify the administration's sanctuary city injunction. Now, it's clear from the president's original order and from Sessions' new memo that the attempt is to incentivize local cooperation with federal immigration efforts uh, by cutting funding to what the White House is calling a few small grants. But the question remains, is this effort legal? Mo, I'm going to come to you on this. Uh, lots of controversy around the notion of sanctuary cities uh, and this issue of funding. Now, traditionally, constitutionally, it's Congress that delegates how money is spent uh, with our government. Do you take issue at all with uh, this executive order? Yeah, I do. Now, I'm not a legal expert, so I'm going to... Everybody can't be, Mo. Don't worry right? about yeah. it. <laughs> you on, 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 and other people smarter than I on the legality of it. I do think you're right. Constitutionally, it's up to the Congress, not to the executive. But I also think that this is just as much a political discussion as it is a legal one. And, and, I, and the political lines are very clear in why each side is saying and doing what it's saying. Right? In these cities where there are large numbers of immigrants, in cities that tend to vote more democratic, city, cities where there is so much resistance to the president's whole approach to immigration, mm -hmm. it makes sense from a political perspective why the mayors are saying and doing what they are saying, and they've got a support of ma the majority of their residents. Mm -hmm. For the president to take them on makes sense for his constituency. Whether or not this becomes a legal battle, well, it's clearly becoming a yeah. legal battle, and I think the question of who's got the authority, mm -hmm. right? But the, the political battle lines, no matter how the, the courts rule on this, each side is going to claim some, some, some level of political, political victory. victory. Well, right. This is everything that's wrong with politics. It's not that it makes sense because the city mayors represent Democrats yeah. and Trump represents Republicans. What makes sense is that we have a nation that has the rule of law, yep. and we're nations of laws and not men. I don't have the right to pick and choose what laws I decide are morally right for me to obey and disobey. Mayors don't have that right. Governors don't have that right. This is the glue that holds us together as a country. And when a city just decides unilaterally, we will be a sanctuary city because we want it to be, we will violate a federal law because we choose to do so, because we think morally we know better and we're wiser, it is an unraveling of what this country stands for. No, if you don't like a law, change the law, but obey the law until then. That's why I problem with sanctuary cities. Well, the, the country also stands for federalism, which says that the federal government can't force local governments to do its bidding, including when you're talking about immigration. Well, and that's, so that's, the other, the issue. that's the other problem, right? Oh. The other problem is the federal government telling, the, uh, telling these local police uh, departments to go in there and make these raids and do these things that should be the federal government's job. No, what they're the saying is after you arrest heading. somebody, let us know if you're going to release them so we can come get them. We have a warrant for they them. They can't force the cities aren't that. doing they, that. See, this is the great, you guys, this is like the Supreme Court right here. This is the cross-jurisdictional arguments that the Supreme Court will have. I'm oh. going to uh, defer to Ari Fleischer. I, I agree wholeheartedly with Ari just said. So All right. Concurrent from bowling on that one. President Trump's budget aiming to rein in out-of-control government spending and debt. But apparently, uh, it's so offensive to some Dems that even Hillary Clinton can't stay silent. Don't go away. Democrats are finding a new issue to fall into hysterics over. President Trump's new budget, which aggressively tries to bring down the government's skyrocketing debt and spending, even Hillary Clinton can't help herself. This budget, along with the relentless attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, shows an unimaginable level of cruelty and lack of imagination and disdain for the struggles of millions of Americans, including millions of children, every single day. Subtle. 
Mick Mulvaney, President Trump's budget director, delivered a much different take on Capitol Hill today. The first time in my memory, at least, this is a budget that was written from the perspective of the people who actually pay for the government. And we went line by line through what this government does and asked ourselves, can we justify this to the folks who are actually paying for it? Exactly. I'm so sick of these kind of hysterics when it comes to cutting anything ever. We're bringing down most of these programs to, you know, the, the mid-2000s level, and they're acting like we're just stripping everything away, and everybody really needs to calm down. Can I throw something in here? This is a conservative's dream budget. Um, you have increased in spending for military, for defense, for homeland security, and for veterans affairs. And get this, the EPA is gutted at 30% drop in spending. Labor, 20% drop. State Department, 29%. Conservatives like this. So all day long before, the, you know, while this was being mashed out on TV, the left was saying, this can't happen. This budget doesn't do what it, say, what it says it's going to do because you'll never get 3% growth. And they're hung up on 3% growth. Let me tell you a little bit about growth. From 1947 till this year, the United States has had over 3% growth. We've had 3.21% growth, and we've had as high as 16.9% growth. So when you give people more of their own money, when you spend wisely, that brings growth. When you reform taxes, 3% is not an unattainable task. Hell, we had 2% growth under Obama, and it was a disaster. You know, and Eric, what you just said is the key to balancing budgets, and that's why the last budget got balanced. I was in the room when they were having the negotiations in 97 about the, what they called the balanced budget legislation. And one day the budget numbers came in, a budget cruncher came in and said we have a couple hundred billion more in anticipated revenue because the money's flooding in because economic growth was so great in the mid-90s. That's the key to getting this done. And so I approach it that way. But the other thing that's missing in this budget is there's nothing on Social Security reform and nothing on Medicare reform. And those are the entitlements that are driving much of the excessive costs. And when you don't touch those, you do have to go harder after the rest of the programs. That's a lesson about leaving entitlements alone. And I think the reason that those are never touched, Ari, is, be, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that politically the consequences feel very high. When someone goes out and they touch those programs, people get deep into their feelings. I am someone that believes in incentive-based policy, so these cuts, Eric, they actually don't bother me. I will tell you, though, you show me somebody's budget and you, I'll tell you what their values are. So my only critique is why so much inflated spending around some of the Border Patrol issues and things like that. Military, Homeland Security. And I love the military, yeah. and I love that, we and I love our vets. Like I said, we spend a lot of more. I just, budget. Budget. So everything we say, we, we, we racket it up right over here, right? right. This yep. is still yep. isn't a fiscally conservative budget. Not across the board, is Yeah, it? absolutely no, it's not. it's not, right? And, and you know, I, you listen to all the economists, you listen to all the people who actually study this, who say 3% is not attainable. So there's problem number one, that in the short term, 3% is not attainable, so it's not going to hit the marks. Number two, but, but we, we, we are 52 you. minutes into the program before the issue of the CBO numbers that came out today on health care, on the Republican health care bill came out, and it shows that 23 million people are going to lose health care under this That's plan. That's not what it said. It is what it insurance, said. Insurance, not health care. Okay. There's no, a huge difference between health insurance. The insurance you have <laughs> under Obama. And I don't, and I don't like no, no, no. it. There, like the there are going to be a Big lot of difference. people out there who and, and lose no. the ability no. to pay for health care. Obama, Obamacare reality. reality. See, here's the thing. I really resent the idea that just because the government's going to stop providing something to someone, that that means automatically that no, people are not going to stop getting it. This is the way people freaked out in 1996 when Bill Clinton had welfare reform. People said kids were going to be dying, mothers were going to be out on the streets. And you know yeah, what happened? I don't, I don't people want got jobs. I don't want people got jobs, and then people actually got source or got resources I, from other places besides I'm the government, from charities when they needed them. And actually, the rate of infant deaths went. Down. I'm so this kind of this kind of hysteric hysterics from com coming from everybody. Well, everyone's everybody gonna die. Is. Everyone's gonna get sick and they're gonna die and everyone's gonna be so poor. And it's not that serious. <laughs> and a lot of times, private solutions are better. And when we employ these kind of tactics of just what, hysterics, then that seeing. keeps us from ever being able to consider a private solution. Well, you did. You said that people are going to be without it. Just because the government's not providing people it doesn't mean they're going to be without it. lose insurance. Insurance is going to become more difficult for more people. It's going to be more expensive for more people. I'm <laughs> no, not no, saying no, that's people the other part. The that's a, tall, that's okay. a tall comment coming from uh, under Obamacare. They just released on Tuesday, yesterday, they released a one 
105% increase in premiums across the board. In large part of, because on, the on president Obamacare. is destabilizing it by creating so much uncertainty in the insurance this market. But the, right, those premiums so are the reality up, is, though, huh? the reality is right. that more and more people are going to be are good. A lot of the programs that the president spoke to during the campaign, people he said he wanted to help, are going to have a harder time under this budget. Right. Why a lot of Republicans get going. are walking away from we it. we got to get going, everybody. All right, don't go away. We're going to circle back with our specialists, Ari Fleischer and Moe Lathy, right after this. All right, time to circle back with our specialist, Ari Fleischer, Omo uh, Ari, I'm going to start with you, former secretary, uh, uh, press secretary under George W. Bush 43. I noticed that Sean Spicer has been noticeably absent from this foreign policy yeah. trip camera. Anything unusual about that? No, that's what I did, too. When you travel abroad, you let the president be the messenger. He carries the weight, and he gets the pictures of him. You don't do a briefing. Uh, and that's one of the joys of those foreign trips, too. It's like a day off. <laughs> okay, Ebony. Very nice. I'm going to go with Mo. Um, Hillary Clinton saying her piece about the uh, budget. Is this an effort by her to reinsert herself into the political conversation? No, I don't think so. I think she still plays an important role in the party. And you've got all these disparate groups trying to make up the, the resistance. And I think a lot of it is a drift. I think a lot of just competing messages. So there need to be a handful of big Democrats to kind of focus the conversation, I think, from time to time. Right. Yeah, I have a question for you, too. So you said karaoke bars? Yes, I would. Do you have a specific song that you always go for? I, I don't choose the song. The song chooses me. The song? <laughs> I, I am but a vessel. I am I but understand. a vessel, Pat. I feel that way. So I love yeah. it. It's myself. So, so we have a couple of seconds here very quickly. Does anyone, has anyone seen Twin Peaks? No, no. you not even know what's going God, on. Can anyone tell me what the heck is going on? I spent two I hours watching. You games, should have been watching The Bachelorette, Eric. That was your first problem. That will not happen. My wife likes The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. I won't be doing that. <laughs> the Twin Peaks? Nobody? No. Never Ask Ari. Ari doesn't know. even know who Katy Perry is. Yeah, Katy. You got that right. Katie. With a 13 year old daughter, no less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to leave it right there. I'm going to say thank you to our Fox good. News specialist today, Ari Fleischer and Moe Thank you guys both very much. And we thank. You all for watching. Make sure to follow us on social media at Specialist FNC on Twitter and Facebook. And remember, five o'clock will never be the same. Special report coming up right now. Five, four, three, two.